thank you very much for joining us. My name's Chris Cubbage. I'm the editor with My Security Media. We publish the Australia in Space magazine, and this is also in association with our Drastic channel, which covers drones, robotics, and AI. Today, we're going to be looking at drones and robotics in security operations with applications and opportunities in Australia and in Singapore. And this is also going to include a briefing uh, on the Indo-Pacific Space and Earth Conference being held in Perth, 23rd to 24th of October, uh, in just a few short weeks away. Uh, we'll go for about an hour. And here, just in terms of this session is being recorded, it will be made available uh, probably within 24 hours, if not uh, earlier. There is media present uh, and Q&A is very much welcome here. Um, the format for today, we're going to hear from each of these uh, platforms just for about three to five minutes each. Uh, we'll hold off questions until there. You can fire on in questions as they go, though, uh, and then we'll have a discussion and uh, Q&A at the end of this. And then David Betray from Perth will brief us on uh, where we're at with the Indo-Pacific Space and Earth Conference. Uh, if you're not uh, familiar with who we are, I mentioned we publish the Australian Space Magazine. We also do Australia in Space TV, and we have a MySec.TV uh, uh, channel as well. We, we uh, have a lot of uh, sort of content there in relation to drones and robotics in the past. Uh, so this is, as I said, in association with Drastic and our Space and Defence News channel. Uh, we've been doing events all throughout the year, This, including virtual events. Uh, this is on the back of an Advanced Robotics in Australia session we did a few weeks ago. That content is available, as well as uh, sessions with Australia in Israel and a Security Consultant Insights series. Uh, and uh, sundowner events across the east coast of Australia uh, as well. And as I mentioned, leading up into IPSEC 2023. Thank you very much to our national sponsors, Fugro Spark, Curtin University and Arose, and our community and educational su uh, supporters, One Giant Leap Foundation and the Annie Thomas Space Foundation. I mentioned that we did a session with Advanced Robotics in Australia, and that was with the Robotics Australia Group, Arose, Advanced Navigation, who just opened up an AI tech facility here in Botany uh, in Sydney yesterday. Very impressive technology with subsurface uh, robotics uh, as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, worth having a look at that. And today, let me introduce our panel, Weiling Zhang uh, from Valaris in Singapore. Mike Monick, CEO with DroneSec, he's in Melbourne. Benjamin Chia, co-founder with KBAM Robotics. I've had the pleasure of visiting uh, KBAM in Singapore. Uh, Jackie uh, Jamonvik, I beg your pardon, however, UAV, uh, hiding out in her car. And Roman Quivley, uh, non-executive director, Codex Security Ventures Australia. And Roman and I have known each other for many years uh, as well. So look, we'll get underway and uh, we'll keep it relatively informal as we go through. We'll have uh, some slide shares uh, as well and I'll just go back. So we're going to start with Wee Ling. I'm going to bring Wee Ling. I'll make you host and I'll stop my share. Right. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. My name is Wee Ling. I come from a company called Volaris. We're based out in Singapore. And today I'll just take a little bit of time to share the concept of tethered drones, which we realize isn't very uh, common. Uh, and not many people actually know about this. Uh, so we, we just in general share uh, what the Tethered Drone is and how it's being used from a security perspective. Uh, so Tethered Drone use case have four main uh, use cases, law enforcement, public safety, disaster, and uh, events with massive crowds. Uh, today, I'll just focus on the events uh, portion of it, the safety when it comes to events. Now, event security, all of us knows, covers a huge area and usually involves thousands of people. Uh, in, in the case of the recently concluded uh, F1 race in Singapore, uh, all the after-race events uh, are big events with thousands of people at any point of time. And in this kind of situation, in this kind of events, you have a lot of blind spots uh, where ground cameras might not 100% give you the full situation uh, picture of what's happening on the ground. Uh, and so there is no complete overview on the overall site. Uh, so this is where a lot of companies actually use uh, a drone. Um, and a drone provides a good area view. And in recent times, drones uh, uh, cameras have improved a lot in terms of the zoom. So what a lot of people will do, or a lot of security company will do, is they'll pop a drone up. Uh, and then you'll fly it for maybe 20 minutes, get it down, uh, change the battery, got it, get it up again. 
Uh, so instead of uh, uh, of uh, frequently changing battery, because these events last for hours, uh, Tether drone enables this uh, drone to fly for indefinite amount of time, basically by putting in a power cable to the drone. And because uh, in a lot of countries, you're not uh, allowed to overfly people anyway. So drones are usually kept to a few spots. So up to 100 meters high up, what you do is you then zoom in at the various points. And I think one of the um, uh, trends when it comes to security system is some sort of automation. And that is something that we have built as well. So this is a software called Sentry Mode. It's an extremely simple software. Basically, it allows you, uh, you have a lot of uh, crowds. And sometimes there are critical viewpoints where security companies are very interested at revisiting all the time. For example, the entrance, the stage areas, uh, the water refreshment areas. So these are viewpoints that uh, security companies are interested in throughout the whole event all the time. right? And there could be incidents that's happening at all these important viewpoints. And so uh, when it comes to, to situation awareness, when there isn't enough situation awareness, the ground force that the, the security company has might not be properly equipped of what's going on. Or oftentimes when they arrive at the scene, they might not have already known what has happened in, in that area. So then this creates a lot of unnecessary panic or disorder. So that area view actually allows that to happen. And so what we have done is that this, uh, back to the software, uh, is that it's a very simple software. It automates these viewpoints. So you're allowed to record uh, 10, 20, 30 important viewpoints. And throughout the whole event, the drone is just simply cycling through all these viewpoints for maybe 10 seconds each. And that gives an overall situation awareness of the whole event. And you could just do this by having just one man with the drone because it's automated, right? The drone is up there. It's cycling through its viewpoints. Uh, so in terms of manpower effectiveness, uh, it, it's, it's quite efficient. And in terms of situation awareness, uh, now control center actually gets a very good overview of uh, what's happening. And so, like I say, you have a lot of viewpoints in an event type of security and you want zoom in, sometimes you want zoom out to get a sense of where the crowd is moving. Sometimes you want very zoom in in terms of looking at very clear um, places, for example, entrances, you want to get a view of the queue that's forming up. And so at various points, you, various zoom angles, everything can be recorded, pre-recorded and just cycling through during the whole event, right? So you pop one of these drone up, it's up there for three hours and it, in the three hours duration, it's periodically checking all these important viewpoints that it's giving. And this is a little bit different and I find uh, most security companies find this quite unfamiliar with because they are, they are quite familiar with uh, having a, a free flying drone. Right, and they're just flying from place to place manually uh, doing this. Uh, but with optics being very good right now, with zoom being very good right now, they can actually have the drone have stationary and then just keep zooming in at the various uh, important points that they want for the event. Yep, so it's very simple. And what we advocate is that uh, with, with this system, it just gives much better situation awareness and allows you to deploy your team uh, in, in a much coordinated fashion. Uh, the last thing is that um, we believe um, most security systems or robotics systems in the market today will have some sort of integration. So oftentimes it's not just that particular system itself. Uh, we are working towards it as well. So we have uh, v lights, which is a light attachment, but more importantly, we also have a vehicle follow mode, which is you put this whole tethered onto a vehicle or in the future, any sort of robots. And then you give this vehicle or you give that robot that, that elevated viewpoint. Of course, it's automated as well because it's following the robot, it's following that vehicle uh, automatically. You don't have to uh, uh, manually pilot it. But that this whole point about integration is, is important for us as well. We believe that the drone will not act alone in the future. It will be part of a much larger security system. Yeah. Wonderful so, feeling. Yeah. So that's that's the end of my presentation. Jackie, can we come to you? Yeah. And... <laughs> 
Thank you. you can come to me because I didn't bring any slides, so I'm just going <laughs> to talk. Well, look, <laughs> so, and I'm going to keep it very quickly. Go. Um, do you want me to start? Or do you want to introduce me? Sorry. Ja <laughs> just Jackie Demovic, De uh, CEO with Hover UAV. We met recently in Sydney at the Security Expo. Uh, but Hover UAV tells us half about what you're doing. Uh, maybe just talk us through uh, particularly the, the type of business you've got and the platform that you deploy. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, as um, Chris mentioned, I'm the CEO and founder of Hover UAV. Uh, so what we do is we love to help people move forward with their drone programs. So we've been doing it now for about nine and a half years. And we, you know, we work with manufacturers and governments and we, you know, gain those complex operational approvals to help them move forward. So a lot, you know, some of them, may, we've been so lucky to work with so many first of type projects over the year. We've worked with the Google Wing when they came into Australia doing drone delivery. Uh, we've worked with companies that, you know, uh, this one girl from New Zealand, she actually invented a product to disperse fog. So we helped her gain those approvals to fly her product on a big drone at airports to clear fog to open the airports up. We've also gained a lot of the first remote operations approvals, which we'll talk a little bit about remote operations in a second. Um, and yeah, so I'm just got, sort of going to talk to you about, I guess we met at the security conference and I guess why we were there is security, I believe, is that next stage for drones. You know, the last few years we've been so busy with the mining and um, government and utility clients because they've really got low ground risk and low air risk. So the chance of something happening is quite low. Um, but there's been so many amazing advancements in the technology and also in the regulatory spaces where we sit a lot. Now it's the time for that security sector to move forward. So we've been able to gain approvals like um, beyond visual line of sight. So Usually, you know, you might think of drones as someone going out there with a controller, you know, flying one drone and they can visually see it to do an inspection or, you know, check for security. Um, now it's flying, you can fly, you know, I can sit in my office on the Gold Coast or I could probably sit in my car right here and be flying a drone in Western Australia or a different location. Um, so that's beyond visual line of sight and you use other mitigating factors like you use tools and equipment and procedures to mitigate the risk. Um, we're also getting things to one to many with the new advancements in technology such as drone in the boxes. So that's when Chris came over at the conference. He said, look, there's lots of these are pretty amazing, you know, technology. What are they? So they're, they're drone in the boxes. So these boxes can live, you know, at any site. They can be on the back of a, a car or they can be permanently at a secure, like at a site. Um, and what they do is they hold the drone, the communication, they house it, they charge it. And what that enables to do is um, you don't need the person out there. So we are starting to do a lot of approvals beyond visual line of sight from a remote location, but one to many. And what that means is so the one pilot, because we still have to have a pilot in the loop at the moment. Um, unfortunately, we haven't been able to push the regulator that far to be full autonomous yet. Um, you need a person in the loop. But with the advancement of the technology, you can now fly one drone to multiple at the same time. Um, and why I felt that it was time for the security industry is uh, the CASA and the regulator in Australia, and actually some of the other places around the world, I know there's a few people from other parts, are now allowing flights near or over people. So we've been able to gain some of the first approvals in Australia for, you know, some of the more popular drones, DJIs and things like that to now fly over people, um, which is now opening up to the security market. Wonderful. So, yeah, that's sort of where we sit. Um, it's Do definitely you, you that. Do you call yourself uh, a re uh, an integrator? Yeah, so... I like to just solve problems. <laughs> so we like to sort of, you know, work with them to go, you know, how are you actually going to make this work? And and not just now, like how are you going to build that infrastructure? You know, hardware is going to keep changing. So what are those systems and procedures and the communications that you're going to require to, you know, be operating thousands of these around the country? All right. I like it. it uh, and it is an important aspect of drones. Just the, yeah. Obviously, the, the hardware and just flying it is one aspect, but then the managing uh, that is another one. And uh, just in terms of the audience, we've got state, uh, local and federal uh, government representatives and the like. And uh, so great to have you on, Jackie. And we'll come back and discuss some of that regulations at the top of my discussion point here.
Okay, back to drone sec and Mike. I'm going to make you host now. Well, yeah. So look, my name is Mike Monick. I'm the CEO and founder of DroneSec. Um, so we focus on drone threats, um, and I'll, I'll take you through what we're seeing in the space, and then how that kind of interfaces with our our tool and our offering. Um, so you know, when we think of drones flying indoor, outdoor, or close to the ground, up near planes, all connected to the internet. Some are fully remote. Some aren't. Um, there's a lot of threats and risk vectors that go in there. So I am going to be that kind of bad perspective guy who comes from the adversary side. I uh, spent a lot of my life being a red team operator, flying drones against sensitive locations, oil and gas facilities, substations to try and determine what their weaknesses were, right? And, um, you know, just like law enforcement can use drones, this is an example of some people on the internet who wanted to know what was going on in a hedge fund's floor on the top of a skyscraper so they put the call out someone on the internet launched a drone flew up to the top of that building and was able to spy in there and live stream it to the rest of the world and they were able to determine what was happening at that point in time very easy it's because drones are so cheap accessible affordable and unfortunately some of that innovation has just led to bad actors using them shuffling narcotics into prisons, contraband. We've got weapons and arms smuggling across borders, uh, IED-based proximity drones down the bottom left used by cartels and criminals. So a lot of potentially negative uses for these types of robotic applications. But in terms of what we're seeing with the, the trends, there's a lot of border crossing. There's a lot of you know sports games intruded on. But the most dangerous we're seeing includes, you know, assassination attempts of gang leaders with drones in places where there aren't wars, right? Loading uh, contraband and C4 and all that kind of thing to drones in order to do some of those attacks or disable types of events. So those are the main trends. It's just becoming a lot more accessible for anyone to 3D, 3D print their own payload dropping systems, look at conflict zones and what they're doing there, and even, you know, take those FPV drones, attach larger payloads to them to go further uh, and faster to be able to take certain targets out. And these are transitioning across into non-conflict areas as well, which is, you know, can be quite surprising. So with the the heavy payloads that they're able to carry, um, for example, we're seeing, you know, shuffling of, of narcotics and cigarettes and so forth across borders in the 12, 18 and even 25 kg range. Uh, where often they don't care if the drone comes down and crashes because it's all about the value of the contraband. So the, the value of the drone is kind of a moot point here. Um, and everything and anything, including people, are now being flown across borders with these types of systems. Um, again, something we're keeping track of is these modifications. You know, it's not just the camera payloads now. We're looking at payload droppers to carry and drop anything that just works off the shelf with a, a piece of drone tech. You can go on Etsy and purchase these systems at any point in time, which unfortunately turns the innovation into quite a dangerous threat model for a lot of safety and security um, applications, perimeters, facilities, and so forth. Uh, and that's just, you know, you can purchase that right now and it will deliver to your door in Australia, right? There's not much restriction around that for the reason that it is such an innovative and, and newly changing space, right? And if you don't have those materials, of course, it can be built out of cardboard or elastic bands and, and scrap materials because it just is so flexible and cheap and affordable. Um, and then the last point I want to touch on is just, you know, we're continuing to see security uh, perimeters and forces use drones, but there's all these, um, you know, protocols and network ideas that are involved in these systems that all have their own exploitation vectors. So we're seeing bad actors trading vulnerabilities and exploits on the underground or the dark web in order to take out drones, whether that's a, you know, Walmart drone carrying a, a, a payload delivery that they want to get their hands on, or whether it's law enforcement that are trying to do surveillance on them and they want to take it out. You know, we're seeing these increase uh, in terms of those attacks in non-conflict areas again. Um, similar type of thing as these drone light shows. 90% of the time, they're amazing. They look great. They work very well. But we're seeing so much innovation that they lack the security hardening perspective or even the thought about it. And so you're getting these intentional attacks against these drone light shows where they're made to be this fun type of idea that's happening in a public space, yet they're being spoofed into crashing into people, vehicles, what have you, uh, because of a protest group or some rioters wanting to, to change that event up. So, look, our platform is a threat intelligence platform. We've driven into 
you know, how and why and where these threats are happening. And then we provide that to military, law enforcement, government, the likes, uh, and let them know how to combat those and how to prepare themselves to protect their drone of fleet, fleet of drones, should I say, against those types of attacks. Um, and, you know, this is a very small percentage of one month uh, where there are incidents occurring all over the world of different types. So it really does pay to have that situation yeah. awareness and be uh, aware of all that. So that's about it. I, I might go into the closing remarks during the um, speech, but, you know, criminals are using this technology, super innovative, helps them hide from that type of fact. Um, and I'm sure we'll dive into some of those during the discussion. So looking forward to that. Thanks, well done, Chris. Mike. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. That we really good perspective on what we're covering today. Okay, wonderful. That's uh, good coverage of drones. We'll touch into the robots now. And Ben, I'm going to make you host with KBAM Robotics. There you go. Crossing to Singapore. Yes, thank you very much, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Uh, it was a very great presentation from like the previous three hosts. So uh, so now we are going to touch more on robots. So uh, let me present some of the robots that Kabam Robotics has in. So this is the CoLab. This is our indoor security uh, inspection robot. Uh, most, just want to share the background of uh, the robots that we, we produce and manufacture and deploy. Most importantly is that I think after post-COVID, the world has ex is currently experiencing the labor crunch. So it's it started in um, we started filling in Singapore, and I believe after speaking to many customers and even contacts that we have globally, everyone is feeling the same thing. So one of the aspects of the robot is actually what it does well is to we is to do and to perform tasks that is repetitive that the humans are currently doing. And for security guards, um, they're currently doing their patrols as a very repetitive task. And that actually covers 60 to 70% of their daily tasks every day. So one thing that this robot that you can see here is currently doing is doing the patrols, the security and surveillance, as well as the inspection portion for the security guards. And one of and uh, equipped with the VAs, the video analytics on the robot. So it would, it would do detections and also send alerts simultaneously to the end users, like the security guards in the remote command centers, as well as in the FCC rooms. And there's a lot of other functions that we also discover that the customers would want the robot to do. And one of them is actually concierge. So you can see here in, in the screen that the robots come with a touch screen. And that's where it can do like various tasks such as concierge, visitor registration, vendor management, escort, as well as uh, if in the shopping centers, you could do like more promotions as, as well. And of course, for the storage compartment, most of our customers use it for putting in a small first aid kit or even a small fire extinguisher. This is the reason why the robots are also commonly used as what we call first responder to an emergency situation. And of course, PA system, I think during the COVID time, a lot of messages have been broadcast where you keep a safe distance and stuff and the robots could help with this task as well. And of course, for this robot, you can see CoLab. We even have an extendable 360 uh, degrees camera. Why we have this is because in an uh, indoor setting, normally it's very crowded. So you want to have the camera view in advantage position. So this can actually be raised up to two meters to cover this, all right? So I want to move on to the next robot, which is Halo. We this this is the outdoor unit that we have, which is which has most of the same functions as CoLab. It's uh, all weather, all terrain, and it's IP rated. So for this robot, it performs the same thing with the video analytics. And I will move on to the software that powers up the robot, which is Smart Plus. So I will spend a bit more time here. The reason why is because the robots is the hardware where the software is being placed but the magic happens in the software. Because in buildings, we are not just having security robots, we have cleaning robots, we have service robots. And one thing that our software does is we actually give the unified platform where all the robots from other manufacturers, not just us, to be unified under one software and then where you can give what we call bi-directional data. That means on one hand, you can get robot statuses, 
and also reports. And on the other hand, you can give commands to your whole fleet of robots from just one platform. And with this platform, you can also have integrations to building infrastructure, CCTVs, access doors, lift integration. And then of course, lastly, all your IoT sensors as well. So this actually gives the robot what we call the communication platform with the other hardware within the building. So they can communicate with each other. And then lastly, if the building has a uh, building management system, even a work management system or even a video management system, this software can actually consolidate all the robots into this backend systems and then task giving what we call the interoperability play within a building. And what I mean by that is allowing the different robots or robotic systems to work together seamlessly and efficiently. And then un understanding this, allowing increased efficiency, flexibility, and allowing the robots to collaborate on different type of tasks, right? So one, one thing I want to actually um, share is also the video analytics here, which on the left, I think it's, it's a very common sight that everybody knows, like people counting, number plate recognition, facial recognition, unattended objects. These are very common. But on the right is what we have developed ourselves, which what we call the inspection modules, which is more towards facility and building, where, for example, 40 lights overflowing then open closed doors, 40 escalators. And then lastly, with everything, as what I mentioned, integrated, this is just a summary of, or you can say, the picture summarizes how interoperability play will exist. So these solutions, as what I mentioned, will is an integral part of the next generation integrated security, empowering the transition from what we call reactive security to proactive detection and prevention. And I think this is very uh, important as, as the world is transitioning with technology, especially robots and drones and, and the rest of the other technologies involved. Wonderful. So, thank you very much. Good work. Thank you, Ben. Uh, and we'll come over to you now, Roman. I'll make you host. I really enjoyed the um, presentation so far. I think, um, you know, congratulations to all the presenters on the capabilities. Uh, Mike, great context setting. I, I really enjoyed the adversarial view of things. Um, it's something that I adopt quite often as well in terms of setting the environmental context in which we work. Um, so yeah, really appreciate that. Um, and welcome to all the uh, non-presenters out there who've joined us. Um, Chris, thank you for putting this all together. Yeah, thanks. Just leave it there for now. I'm not going to talk too much about the capability. I think Ben's done a really good job in uh, describing the capabilities of the Kabam robot. Um, but I'm just going to lift above that level for a couple of minutes just to sort of talk about robotics and security more broadly. So I think it's actually quite a fascinating space. Um, I'll certainly talk to this capability, but... At Codec, uh, we have a thesis that um, we are at an inflection point in humankind where robotics uh, generally um, have evolved in both engineering, which you know, Ben calls the hardware, but also the smarts, which Ben refer referenced as the software. Uh, they have both evolved to a point where we, we are able to converge them to actually be functional and have great utility in all applications across society. Uh, and I will talk about security in a moment, but if you think about the uh, dexterity that we can now imbue in the engineering, uh, the mechanical engineering of robots and what they can do, some of the uh, experimental work that we're doing with our partner Cobalt Robotics in San Francisco goes to such extent where we are finessing the dexterity of robots to be able to shave people who are disabled. Uh, we've got robotics working in uh, aged care homes where they can uh, move age or disabled people in and out of uh, beds or chairs. Um, and even as uh, simply functional as being able to have small carts that move through aged care precincts with uh, medications to deliver that or, or particular responses that might need. So we're very much of the view that robots as a service um, is at the cusp of a very, very fast evolution and trajectory to help mankind and humankind more broadly. One of the applications which we think is highly functional right now is security. Wow. Now, clearly, we've seen already a suite of technologies here 
uh, from the existing presenters um, that show you different forms of technology. In robotics, they call it form factors. That is, what does it look like? And we've all seen the uh, the Boston Robotics dogs jumping up and down. That's sort of either intimidating or cool, depending which way you look at it. Um, you've got the kabam form factor. Um, there are others out there that are big eggs or they look like police cars or mocked up as security. Our indoor robot, which you see on the screen there, is meant as a corporate um, uh, piece of furniture. You know, it's high end, it's sleek, it's got a soft outer form, the skin, um, it's got a uh, a presence about it, which I want to talk about a little bit in terms of robotics, because robots can be quite intimidating to human beings. There's this, uh, there's this psychological, psychosocial analyses of the way humans, that is consumers of robots, interact with robots. And it's called the uncanny valley. So it's at a point where the robots don't look like humanoids. They look like something like the Kabam robot or the one that's on the screen. Humans are quite happy to interact with that. They're not intimidated by it. It doesn't, it doesn't invoke any fears or concerns or anxieties around uh, machines and machines taking over humans or being aggressive. But the more that form moves to a human, humanoid look, the less people become inclined to integrate with it. So it's very important in the context of robotics, if you want it to be functional, particularly in a context of security where the robots are interacting with humans all around them, that there's a level of movement away from that uncanny valley where the level of interaction drops. And that's important for a reason I'll mention in a moment. But then interestingly enough, just uh, for the psychology fans out there, as that form factor becomes more human-like, so it looks like you and I, the uptick in interaction with that robot suddenly increases beyond where it originally was. So that drop is called the uncanny valley, and it's something that we're very conscious of in the context of integrating robotics in the way humans work and operate. With security robots, um, you know, drones are one form factor. You've got indoor robots, outdoor robots. You can have unmanned maritime uh, uh, vessels, etc. It, it, it matters little that the smart is actually in the software, the integration with existing systems, whether that's building management, whether it's other um, systems like CCTV, it's in the AI and the machine learning. Uh, we talk about data analytics. Um, the, For example, the smarts in the cobalt robot that you see there, very, very evolved. Uh, the, the sensors in this, these robots are 60 odd and they're all the traditional ones you know about video and audio, et cetera, but they also pick up a whole bunch of things that aren't traditionally in the security domain, things like humidity, Wi-Fi strength, temperature, chemicals in the air. You can program, as Ben said, to identify things which are anomalous, but not necessarily security related. So it might be overflowing bins, it might be spills on the floor, it might be congestion at an airport departure gate. And you can then incorporate through APIs additional AI into the smarts of robots like this we are currently um, partnering, and I'll finish on this point, uh, Chris, because I know there are lots of questions and you're trying to keep tight, but we're partnering with a wonderfully uh, smart Australian AI tech. And I'm, I'm going to give it to you in layperson's terms because it's easy to understand. You can get a CCTV, let's go call it a single camera on a, a camera on a lobby precinct, for example. You pull that feed into a platform and that platform replicates that feed up to 30 times. So you've got 30 instances of the same CCTV feed. Then what you can do is you put on a marketplace and you say, I want 10 analytics on those feeds. I want facial recognition. I want anomaly detection. I want fast movement detection. I want um, heat censoring, whatever or it is. And you sort of switch on and off the, the, the analytics that you want on the feeds. And then they are integrated um, in a system like Ben mentioned, uh, you know, Cobalt, we've got one as well. It's an Omni system, which uh, basically triages all the feeds and you can automate alerts and responses, et cetera. All of that's really cool. Um, the last point I would make uh, uh, is around adoption. Um, adoption within the client bases, uh, particularly where there's members of the public involved in robotics is always something that is uh, in transition. You know, uh, you're talking to clients who are not necessarily digitally native, so there's a bit of 
concern around what that might look like. There are industrial issues. You know, it was mentioned before about robots replacing humans. We say augmentation, but ultimately there's going to be some form of uh, displacement. Uh, technology as a suite, whether it's robots, doesn't matter, will augment and replace or displace some human capacity at some point down the track. Um, and then the integrations, uh, how do humans integrate? Is there a human in the loop? As Mike said, in our case, we do have one. We have global call centers. You press the screen. You're uh, someone who wants an escort to a car park after work. The, the, the robot can come out of its pre-programmed patrol and can have a conversation with the employee as they're escorted to the car park. The employee can actually touch the screen and talk to a human in the loop if they want to. And so there's a great degree of versatility in the way robots can be deployed. I might stop there, Chris, because I, I will talk forever. <laughs> no, all good. Um, and look, and put it in the context of, of what we're seeing, you've got uh, police now using robots uh, deployed in Singapore. There is a force multiplier and uh, they've, they've built their own. Unfortunately, they didn't use KBAN, which I was very disappointed with. You got uh, New York Police Department just signed up with Nightscope uh, on theirs, and they're the egg egg shaped ones. Uh, and I'm a seed investor in Nightscope, so I've been watching this for some time. Um, and I think you're quite right. You look at now Elon Musk's uh, humanoid robot, the Boston Dy uh, Dynamics robots. Uh, there's a humanoid robot with Woodside over in Perth, again bringing that into a, the IPSEC uh, Indo Pacific Space and Earth Conference. There's a lot going on in remote operations. Uh, and uh, for those internationally, uh, you know, most of our mines over in Western Australia are remotely operated and autonomous vehicles uh, are in control. So the extent of that, um, one thing I've got, I might start off with uh, with Mike, is are you, with your drone sec, are you seeing much now in the robotic side of things starting to occur? Uh, and then we'll I'll start to read through the um, the audience questions. But yeah, just the amount of incidents with drones. Are you seeing the emergence of uh, robotic incidents coming into your domain? Yeah, so we we consider land, sea, um, and air as as different domains, right? But all under drones. So we do track those. And aerial drones have the vast majority of these types of effects and threats. But for example, you know, there was a number of police forces who were trialing some of those, um, you know, Boston Robotics dogs. And I, I won't say they were, you know, Boston Dynamics brand because there was other brands involved. Yeah. But for example, a um, methodology came out on the underground on how to disable these. So you could walk up to it, pull a lever, disable the, the dog right there and then. And this shared like wildfire across some of those threat groups because they said if they are ever faced with this system, um, that's how you disable it. And so threat actors are putting together glossaries on exactly how to evade each type of robot, robot or, or drone system, right? And we've seen that with maritime drones, aerial drones. So yes, in a nutshell, there is um, application to other types of UGVs or, or UUVs and so forth. Aerial drones take the, the main share. Um, but just think of it in this context, where you have criminal groups that have um, certain amounts of, of money available to them, and they see an autonomous system as something in their way, as performing surveillance on them or preventing their operations from occurring, they're going to drop some serious cash and effort into that. Uh, and if that's hiring someone who's an expert in drones to get their own drones to do that, or it's someone to help defeat them by putting together DIY jammers or spoofers, they're going to do that, and that is happening in almost every country in the world right now. Good answer, and I think that's definitely much. In terms of the deployment of this technology, uh, your workforce, you can't have more robots than humans because that, that could be taken out in some sort of ransomware or denial of service attack, and suddenly you're left uh, with nothing. So I think it's really uh, something to – the knife always cuts both ways on this technology. All right, um, we've got uh, a number of uh, – dozen of people in here if you want to ask a question please do question for jackie here what will drones contribute to the security ecosystem in five to ten years time that they will not contribute today yeah where do you see the gap and and the and the, the pace of change that you're seeing and where you might where we might be in five years in five years hopefully we're starting to move to autonomy i think the next five years we've got to build the procedures and you know um 
you know, test the robustness of the systems as well and, you know, how are they all going to be managed. In five years, they're going to be moved, starting to move to sort of more very highly autonomous or autonomous and that's where we'll be going from five to ten years. So um, they can be, like, you know, widely scaled, you know, placed in every location um, and, you know, it's more monitoring the um, maintenance um, and the systems more than actually like piloting or flying them, if that makes sense. They'll be autonomous. That's where I see. <laughs> Very good answer. And I've just um, seen a, a, a funny question here is my night, night scope shares are performing poorly. Welcome to the, my world. Uh, and how can I invest in K-Band? <laughs> so uh, we'll put you in contact uh, if you like. But, yeah, I keep watching those night scope shares. And uh, they did get to $28 for like half an hour. And now they're like a dollar or something underneath. Um, the estimated prices for KBAM ro robots question here, uh, I'll put you in contact with KBAM direct. Um, but yeah, I suppose let's have a discussion on the business case, if you don't mind, Roman and Ben on, on the robot side of things. Um, yep. what, what's your general approach to business case for these and the savings or do you more to sell the benefits? No, let me let me kick off on that. I, I yeah. think so that's useful without sort of getting into too many specifics. So, one of the uh, advantages that uh, Ben and Welliang mentioned is economies um, and reliability. So, uh, not wanting to disparage human workforces because I've led lots of them, but uh, they do come with inherent problems uh, or challenges that uh, arise out of availability, um, out of reliability. Um, out of uh, industrial issues. None of those clearly exist with robots. They don't go sick. They don't fall asleep. Uh, they're ultra reliable, subject to some of those challenges that were mentioned around um, malware attacks or some countermeasures that Mike mentioned that will happen from time to time as uh, that constant battle goes on between the adversary and, and authorities in terms of the upper hand, whether that's in methodologies or in, in technology. But in broad terms, and, and I'm talking broad terms here, um, the, 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 the economics here go something like this. In Australian dollars, to put a security guard in place 24-7, 365 days a year, will cost a client somewhere in the vicinity of four to four hundred and fifty thousand dollars depends on site and depends on uh skill levels and all that sort of thing um you compare that against the deployment of a robot which will cost the client somewhere around a third of that um depends uh yeah it, it, there are ups and downs and swings and swings and roundabouts but it's about a third of the price um what you can't do to my earlier point is in a small security force let's call it two or three guards in a corporate building, you can't do a one-for-one. -one. Um, that, that's not the way technology is currently at an evolutionary stage of. Um, in a larger workforce of, let's say, 12 to 16 or 20, absolutely, you can do a replacement of one human with a robot and you get much more functionality out of that. You're saving yourself something like $300,000 Australian a year. The advice I give most clients on this, though, is it is a bespoke solution. So when I talked before around robots versus a techno technological augmentation of security, you need to look at the precinct or the uh, the asset that you're trying to protect. You look at the current security ecosystem that sits around that, both in human and non-human resources, because everyone's got fences, everyone's got some security presence, response and or patrols and or guards on site. Um, there is some sort of electronic security or it's access control or CCTV. None of that should be disposed of in a application of a robot. What you do is you look at the existing ecosystem, you work out where the efficiencies are, how a robot can augment the current security infrastructure, and then you implement that in a way that's most economical and most beneficial. And most often that will not be a one-for-one -one replacement of a human with a robot. Most often that is... For example, um, and I know the Kabam robots quite well, um, 
and uh, the Cobalt robot is exactly the same. They are as functional in security as they are in facilities management for detection right. of all those things I mentioned, as they are with concierge and wayfinding. You can stick them in a lobby and people can press, press screens and find wayfinding and get escorted. So when you think about that additional functionality over and above security, you're getting a three-in-one utility application. There is no issue in all of those challenges, surmounting all of those challenges I mentioned earlier around digital adoption and industrial challenges. Say, okay, to the client, that's fine. Keep your, keep your day workforce. Put a robot on on the weekends, on your night shifts, um, and you'll save $300,000 a year. You'll get a better outcome. And slowly, as you become more comfortable, as the robot integrates with your, your building systems and your employees, then you can increase that capacity over time. Start slowly, work your way up, but realize the dividends early. Well, I think that comes back to that night scope is uh, I do have trust that I do see the deployment of these and the increase and in the renewal of the subscriptions continuing. Ben, are you seeing any any particular market verticals that are strong for you? Uh, you know, the shopping centres and and the like, and, and I don't know, sort of single. And it seems you are competing with police, and I'd imagine uh, that that could be a challenge. But you've got the whole of Southeast Asia and and, and the world at your feet as well. Any any market verticals or or countries that you're finding are, are really uh, strong for you? Yeah, so currently, of course, Australia is a very important market for us. All right. And also, my team is also focusing on the US market. So, of course, Nightscope come into the picture. Yeah. Right. But I think most importantly, as what Roman say, right, I think it resonates a lot with me. All right. I just want to bring up some points uh, of my own. So, one thing about robots is that in Singapore, how we face it is that um, for small security companies trying to scale up, so how I how I actually tell them is that imagine you have 100 security guards currently doing 20 sites. You want to scale. That means you want to take over another 20 sites. You need to hire another 100, right? So what I can do is that with the robots implementation, right, you can scale up to 40. You can keep your 100 guards, but you can actually change your existing sites to put in uh, robots, technology, as well as your same amount of humans. So... For example, one site with five humans currently, for example, you can actually reduce it to three, put in two robots, and then the other two humans could be redeployed to another site. That's how you scale up because of the you know manpower scarcity. Of course, this is one of the things that we mentioned in Singapore. I think it applies everywhere else. I agree with Roman also on one uh, sentence of the robots can never replace a human, but it should replace all the repetitive tasks that the human does. From a day to day and then allowing the human to do what we call more, more productive tasks which a robot can't do and then one thing we also understand from like the singapore market especially is that uh a lot of our first customers they always ask that could you put in like 30 40 50 vas into the robot all right and then i told them could we slow down because <laughs> it's like asking a human to do 50 things at one go and yeah. definitely you know it can't do anything very well because all this requires a bit of fine tuning as, and also a bit of programming. So what we always do is we tell the customers, let's start off with the first four or five use cases that will really apply at your current site that will actually justify the cost of the robot there. And then we work our way up, right? For example, what we do is we do in phases. So the first phase, we get the robot in, put in the four or five VAs and detections and tasks that the robots have to do. And then the subsequent phases, what we do is we integrate to the CCTVs, we integrate to the lift, we integrate to the backend systems, all right? Then task allowing the robot to actually comfortably settle in that site. Are you getting, uh, sorry, to, and sorry to interrupt, are you getting um, cooperation from some of the, the primes in that market, the Siemens, the Snyders and the Honeywells? Uh, are you getting engagement from them for high level interface yep. uh, there or are you finding yes. they're resisting? No. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. So that's no. good. I think There's that's no that's critical to get a HLI into a building management system. Uh, yeah, that it's hardly going to work without it. So I think that's really important. Roman, you mentioned that in terms of those APIs uh, early on, but again, I come in from a security consultant's viewpoint. I would have that in my specifications that that has to be done and has to match with the systems that we've got uh, in yeah. our in our premises. And in fact, Ben, ben will attest to this as well. What we're finding is that the, the building management system and 
lift uh, operators and the security service providers want to integrate. And they are very collaborative in, in, in setting up APIs, integrations with their BMSs because they want us to go out and sell to their yeah. clients saying, yes, we are integrated with you know, whatever the, the system's name, names are. It's actually a good selling point. They're, they're very collaborative. Very good. Okay, there's a yeah. question here, and let's touch on on regulation for just a couple of minutes before we hand over to Dave. Um, question on seems to be more for specific to Australia. Where do we see drones and robotics evolving as part of the security industry in terms of regulation, licensing, and certifications? Whoever asked that might well know my background and my pain points there. Um, I suppose for both the drones and robotics, any any gaps that you are currently seeing in terms of regulation uh, at the moment, I suppose it's beyond a visual line of sight for drones and robotics. I take it there's no issues around licensing. Uh, maybe Jackie, any any issues that you're seeing around the regulation? I mean, I think this is a challenge across many, many different fields. And, you know, there's all security license as well. It's not just about the drones. It's like, how does it get installed and things like that? That's why at the moment when we work with people, we actually more, uh, or I should say we collaborate with other companies that understand that security element of it. Um, it's the same with like, you know, as you start doing this, it's not going to just be the aviation regulators. You're going to need noise approvals um, and then sometimes pr different privacy laws and like, you know, there's a whole range of it. And at the moment, yes, it's really frustrating that sometimes it's state specific. Um, I do know the um, Australian Department of Infrastructure and their very long name um, are trying to work on guidance and try to bring it you, more to be a national standard for different things. But yeah, at the moment, yeah, that's all I've got to say on it. <laughs> and I've got two. There was a question for Valaris. Um, how much power is that? Uh, there was a question here around the power. Let me find that. Uh, but back to you, Mike, in terms of regulation, are you, are you checking that out within your platform as well in terms of the local regulation environments? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we do is, is actually track every time there's been a regulation that's changed, giving law enforcement new powers to, say, take down the far or malicious drones or to, say, detect types of drones by kind of eavesdropping on their communications, of course, for the, the bad ones, um, or on the mitigation side. So if there is a rogue drone and you are a law enforcement group, you know, what powers do you have to actually take it down? And in most cases, it's on the federal level by exemption uh, and very specific exemption, even detection in some cases for state police and so forth in different countries can be illegal because it can be seen as wiretapping. So there is a lot of regulatory hurdles. As Jackie said, the Department of Infrastructure and Transport uh, and so forth, they are looking at this problem set from a, a national um, perspective. And then there are many other areas that are thinking about it from a regulatory perspective. Do we give powers to police or do we look at it from the France perspective where they've rolled back on all of those police powers to even use drones or robots because of all the privacy invasion and surveillance laws, which there was a lot of pushback on and now there was a lot less use and they had to get really strict exemptions during the, the recent um, Paris riots in order to even fly a drone down a street, right? So I think it's a sliding scale of where they want to get to without causing too much red tape. But as with anything in the drone industry, and, and Jackie alluded to with BB loss and, and all that type of thing, it will take time uh, for innovation and for the laws to catch up with that innovation. Very interesting. I just wonder if the police robots in Singapore, if you attack one of them, is there is that an aggravated offence because like a, 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 a assaulting a police officer? Uh, would be interesting. I imagine, I don't know, are you aware of any new regulation that they've brought in around their police robots, Ben? Yeah, actually, Chris, this is a very good question because uh, we, we have people attempting to uh, damage or actually vandalize the robots. All right. So one thing, the robots are always covered with insurance. So that's covered, right? But the regulations are still not there. But I think there's a recent spike of cases in Singapore in terms of abuse of security guard, physical abuse. Yeah. So... Of, of course, all the security agencies say that I'd rather have the robots being abused than my human. Because, That's a of course, course so, I suppose. Um, Valerius, uh, sorry, Wheeling, um, there's power going through your, your lead as well. So you said it can stay up for three hours. Can it do longer? You're muted, I'm sorry. Uh, it's in, in, indefinite. 
there, there is power going through the cable, about 800 watts. So if you plug in the typical power generator, it will go on for hours. Beautiful. Well, look, I, I've still got notes uh, that I could keep asking and having this discussion, but uh, we're going to finish at the top of the hour uh, if we can. David, if you can come up on screen, but uh, to our panel, uh, and I've got them up here, but David, I'll make you host in a second. Uh, Willing Zhang, uh, the co-founder with Valarius, C, uh, Mike Monick, CEO with DroneSec, Benjamin Chia, co-founder KBAN Robotics, Jackie Dijonvic, uh, CEO with Hover UAV, Roman Quivlig, uh, the non-executive director with Codex Security Ventures Australia. Thank you so much for a very interesting uh, and insightful session. Uh, and again, left us wanting more for sure. So we'll do it, no doubt have you back. Um, so thank you. I'd give you a virtual round of applause from the audience as well. Uh, and no doubt you got some value out of that. David, I'm going to make you host now and stay tuned. And uh, let's have a walk through the Indo-Pacific Space and Earth Conference. Thank you to our panel. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. Um, good speaking to you here from Perth, uh, David Matray. I'm also uh, Chris's fellow director. First of all, just congratulations to all the speakers today. Fascinating discussion. I think this could have gone for another couple of hours as well from what I can sort of see. I can see the questions coming up. Um, but it also just illustrates the huge opportunity with robotics and brings us to talk about the Indo-Pacific Space and Earth Conference. Uh, the Space and Earth Conference we're running in 22nd to the 24th of October in Perth, Western Australia. Uh, we've got 80 speakers, 12 countries. The focus of the conference is around trade investment and collaboration in addition to research. Um, the conference brings together space and able technologies into other sectors such as agriculture, resources, defence, and just talking about the stuff that you were talking about today in terms of the different applications, uh, I think that's quite relevant to, to what we're actually doing. The speakers that we have, in particular, I want to highlight some of the robotic speakers we have. We've got a contingent out of NASA, and um, I'll, I'll sort of highlight, for example, David Korsmeyer here. He's the De Deputy Centre Director for NASA Ames. One of the things he's talking about is autonomy and expectations versus reality. That's one of the keynotes he's talking about. But you can sort of see the cross-section here of what we have. We've got people from NASA. We've got uh, Atlas Iron, Woodside Energy. We've got CSIRO. We've got the Australian Automation and Robotics Precinct. And this is just a taste of what's there. So some really engaging uh, conversations. I think when you bring people into a webinar, that's, that's terrific. I think when you bring people into a room, there's some magic that happens. As we said earlier, it's uh, it's a two-way street in terms of the discussion. We're trying to create commercial opportunities for companies as well to have those sort of conversations. There's a pitch event too where companies can stand up there and actually talk about their technology. And as, as mentioned earlier, it goes into mining, agriculture, defence and, and so forth. So, yeah, it, uh, invite your door to come. We've got a really heavy and healthy level of uh, support for this. As an example, in terms of some of our community partners, I'll emphasise, for example, the American Chamber of Commerce and the Australian Automation and Robotics Precinct, just to name some. Uh, very good exhibition as well, which will have some robotics in there too. So really keep people engaged. And, um, of course, we need to you know, do a shout out to the uh, state government here, which has been a very big supporter of what we're actually doing and look to do this on an ongoing basis. But, uh, yeah, we've got people coming in from around the world. So... We invite you to come as well and um, to register, please go to www.spaceandearthconference.com and you'll be able to see the program there. Uh, as I said, very healthy and interesting discussions on robotics and we look forward to seeing you in October in Perth. Wonderful. Thanks, Thank you so much, David. Perfect. And I did an interview on Australian Space with uh, Dr Butler Hine, uh, on Helio Swarm, they are doing a, a swarm of satellites, uh, doing research on the sun. But the technology to have a hub satellite with a swarm of sub drone satellites, uh, they're creating new technology just to have that actually work uh, and do the research. So uh, fascinating. He'll be there in Perth as well. Look, um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. We'll start. We'll close it off here. Uh, you can check us out, uh, as David said, spaceandearthconference.com. Otherwise, uh, go to our drasticnews.com channel, uh, and uh, these are all cross-linked. Thank you so much to our panel, and we are start finishing pretty much right on top of the hour. I can't thank you enough. Thank you very much. We'll be back soon. You'll get a Thanks, recording of this uh, tomorrow morning uh, very soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, mate. Good to see you. Bye. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Jamie. Bye. <laughs>
Fairbairn, Roman, thank you so much. Willing, thank you very much. Cheers.